Hello everybody, welcome back to Terrace Talk. Now we're all full of Easter eggs, we're ready for the championship running, uh, we're well into that. Norwich City of course can clinch their promotion back to the Premier League this weekend against Derby County if they beat the Rams and Brentford and Swansea both drop points. It feels like maybe uh, it's been in the pipelines for a while, it'd be nice now to get it automatically confirmed, um, possibly this weekend. Delighted to be joined by Colin Anderson, Norwich fan, and also Corey Hancock from the Rams Review. Um, Colin, we'll, we'll start with you. What is your gut telling you ahead of this weekend? Is this going to be the, the, or is Saturday going to be the day that Norwich finally clinched their promotion, do you think? For the sake of my marriage, living in Derby, married to a Derby fan, um, I still don't think it will be. I, I've got a feeling we don't then play for a week. We play eight o'clock the following Saturday. I get a feeling we're going to be promoted without kicking the ball. It's going to be one of those absolute letdowns, which is going to be brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're, they. I, I guess they're kind of the worst kind. But then equally, with supporters not being there, is is that kind of better? The fact that maybe it's on a day they haven't kicked a ball, I'm not sure. I, I still want to be sat on my sofa watching it cheering it, shouting for it. Um, I don't get to home games, I get to away games. I'm kind of more used to having to do it via the telly. I kind of want to do it ourselves. I just can't see Preston pulling a third result out against big side, bigger sides in the division in three games. So I've got Brentford down for a win, sadly, on Saturday. Would it be nice for you, given your geography and where you live, if, if Norwich did do it this weekend, just for the sort of the bragging rights? <sighs> And it'd be a strange one. So I've lived here 20 years. My wife's a Derby fan. All her family are Derby fans. We have a terrible record at Pride Park since I've lived here. I think I've only seen score three goals in all the years I've been going to games. There was one 4 0 win and I couldn't go. Um, it would be nice. I'm not going to lie. But I just kind of, I think we need too many things to happen on one day. I just can't see it happening Saturday. It will happen the following week, but I can't see it happening Saturday. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. I think too many variables. I think if you're depending on one other result, then maybe it's slightly different. But two, I think, is a big ask, particularly given that, that Swansea and Brentford aren't in particularly great form as it is. Um, Corey, thank you very much for joining us. First and foremost... Um, I want to talk a little bit about your potential takeover, I think we'll, we'll call it. It's been, obviously, a, a, a busy week for Derby off the field. Eric Alonso uh, has agreed a deal with Mel Morris to potentially become Derby County's new owner. You as a supporter, how are you feeling about this? Because, obviously, you've had all the takeover saga, the one that fell through what, just after Christmas, but it rumbled on for a while. How are you feeling about this one? Because it seems that um, Alonso is a fairly controversial figure. Yeah, uh, Connor. I think from from my perspective, uh, it's it's cautious. It's it's cautiously optimistic. I'm trying to be a glass half full kind of guy, um, and Colin knows this. Living with a Derby fan, that most Derby fans are are half glass full kind of people and take everything uh, and think it out before they react and knee jerk. But um, yeah, I try to be uh, very glass half full. Yeah, obviously, I think when whenever you um, Eric Alonso had had a lot of baggage coming from Sheffield uh, Wednesday, where he was that you know. Uh, it's well documented. He was a, uh, you know, an advisor to Chan Siri and was talking to people. Ooh, I'm going to be doing this. If you want to sign players, come through me and, and whatever. Um, I think the BZI, uh, the BZI deal that came through when it was announced, I think it was on Halloween. It was 24 to 48 hours. And that was kind of the mantra for Derby through the autumn into the winter to the turn of the new year. And I think when that period of exclusivity kind of expired and Derby put the statement out that said, Hey, we're moving on from this. I think it was just a sigh of relief from a lot of Derby fans. I don't think it was a situation where it was a surprise. I think we anticipated it, that it was going to be dead in the water. We had nothing had been heard for months. Obviously the deals aren't done in public, so you're not going to hear anything, but you could kind of tell the battle rhythm of how it was going to go, that it was going to fall through. And then we'd heard, Oh, Eric Alonso's interested. Um, and yeah, like you say, Connor, very interesting character, 29 year old Spaniard does boxing promotion, entrepreneur, has money from vineyards, um, and he's a front man for um, uh, the No uh, no Sports, No Limit Sports Limited company. Um, and it looks like he's going to be the front man, according to Kieran Maguire uh, last night. And I want to look at this because I want to make sure they get right, was Indonesian businessman Raja Septa Okahari, and I've probably mispronounced that. So he looks like he's a front man uh, for this group. Um, 
in some sort of consortium or anything like that. And he went on talk sport this morning. He was talking about how, you know, judge him on his work ethic, judge him on, on what he does when he takes over, you know, what's in the past is in the past. Basically we've read some things that he might be looking at trying to do a Brentford style of model of player recruitment of trying to get young players in and either sell them on or be long-term assets to Darby and, and that kind of thing. So for me, I'm a very glass half full kind of person. Um, cautiously optimistic. Darby's been in this situation before with other owners. When you look at uh, the three amigos not too long ago and what they did to it, they had the Americans uh, as well that didn't necessarily help, help the cause as well. Um, but so it'll be, it'll be an interesting thing. And I think the most important thing here for this football club, and I guess for the set of fans is for this deal to get done so that people can start worrying. Obviously we worry about what goes on the pitch as well, but it's one less distraction that might be taking five and 10% off the performances um, that this team don't need right now, because let's be honest and let's be clear, Darby's in a relegation dogfight, and and you need got you got to get the boardroom sorted because this summer, this end of the season, this next six games is massive for Darby. If they go down, it's going to be the carnage, and it'll be cataclysmic what will happen to this football club. But then going into this summer, this is a very important for summer for Darby in terms of player recruitment, player turnover. There are players changing over contracts expiring. And then obviously you've got the new ownership coming in and seeing how that's going to go. So it's going to be a massive six games. It's going to be a massive summer, Connor. And so to answer your question, excited about Eric Alonzo, cautiously optimistic, I think is the best way to put it. But my hope as a fan is let's get this deal done as soon. Let's hopefully not me. I'm not getting the deal done. Let's hope they can get the deal done <laughs> as soon as possible, draw a line under this. And then we don't have to talk about the T word, the takeover any, any longer. Yeah, exactly. We, we've seen uh, a couple of other clubs as well this week, Ipswich being one of them, of course, I guess, from a, a Norwich perspective, uh, be, be taken over. So it does seem like um, hopefully Derby can can get that done and over with and, and you can focus back on the pitch. Corey, before we um, sort of delve into into Derby this season and, uh, and maybe um, why why the club has struggled so much, I think there'll be people watching this, uh, listening to you and go, well, that's not particularly an accent that I'd associate with a, a fan who supports Derby. So tell us a little bit about why you support Derby County, how that came to be, because sometimes I think you can uncover fairly interesting stories when I ask this question. Basically, Connor, I hate myself. That's why. Uh, <laughs> no, um, no. Uh, my dad's from the Derbyshire area. Um, so I've grown up with, a, with, I've got family in the area and everything like that. And my dad, um, he played professionally, coached professionally, scouts professionally and stuff like that. So for me as a young child, always growing up was football, soccer, football was always my number one sport kind of thing. Yeah, I played baseball. Uh, yeah, I, I played American football in college. I was a kicker because it was the closest thing I could do to soccer. Um, there's a picture of me in an England tracksuit at two years old standing on a football. And I always thought, oh, when, when I play for England, Sky will use that. Uh, as my image, but then I realized I'm not going to play for England, America, or anybody really. Um, uh, even my six aside team don't want me to play, which is embarrassing because there's a <laughs> junk lady that plays left wing and they somehow get picked out of me. Um, but yeah, I always grew up with stories of, of football, it was always part of, of, of who I was. And um, becoming a Derby fan, my dad, gr having grown up in the area, knew a lot of Derby players from, from back in the day. Um, two notable names, Jeff Barracliffe and Ray Straw. Um, Angus McDonald was his, Angus McDonald was one of his first coaches. Angus McDonald used to play for Derby. So I grew up with these stories of these led like legendary players, um, and what have you. So it was always a sense of when you're waiting for the results to come in, because when I was growing up, obviously, and I, this is not like, oh, back in the day, I had to walk to the one room schoolhouse in my bare feet and stuff. But obviously the internet wasn't as big as what it is now back when I was growing up. So um, we couldn't necessarily get the news that we get now. So it was, a st it was you know, my dad go out coaching and me and my mom had listened to the World Service Radio and mark results out and stuff like that and whatever. And, um, you know, we, we talk about the games and stuff and always Darby was one, always a result that I looked out for. Um, caveat, my dad's a Blackpool fan. Weird, but whatever. Uh, but so it was always one of those things that, yeah, I, uh, I always just grew up grew up liking football, and I consider myself a football fan first and foremost because I'll watch any game at any level doing anything, really. But also, you know, to that, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Darby County supporter because of that um, and, and how those stories just kind of interwove when I was coming up with football and everything like that. And then I every year that's not a pandemic, I come to Darby. I, I watch a couple games. I spend my vacation doing that. It's not normally a vacation because it's sometimes not great. Um, but you know, I come and I come and watch them as much as I can and everything like that. And, 
Um, yeah, and, and to be involved in this podcast, I've been involved now just um, about 18 months. My friend Jason started it, um, and he allowed me to be a part of this. So me and him chat on the podcast about Darby stuff, and it makes – you know, especially when you're not in the stadium, I can't be in a stadium every week. So for me to have someone to talk about football where there's something that I'm passionate about. Yeah, I can talk with it with my dad or I can talk with it with, you know, a couple other people. But there's not a wide range of people I can talk. Oh, did you see this guy or this guy? And they're going to know that kind of thing. So it's really good for me in a way to to feel connected to an area. I mean, I, I, I love Derby. I love the area. I love England. Um, and so for me, it's part of my heritage and who I am. So. Yeah, that that's basically the main reason why, and you know, it's just it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, that's a that's a lovely story. Thank you for for sharing that, Corey. Um, Colin, I'm going to come to you because I'm sure we could spend the rest of this podcast speaking about Tuesday night and how wonderful that performance was. Seven nil. Um, just to to remind anyone that may have missed it, although I'm sure nobody did. Emphatic, devastating. I don't know if there's any more words you want to add to that. It was, it was, it was actually probably a real joy to watch Norwich City in full flow, wasn't it? It was coming. It had, it had been coming for a while. Someone was due one of those. We are this much better this year, and we are now going to show you. We'd had all the fuss over the Preston game, where you know, if, if we were Leeds fans, it would be some great EFL conspiracy. Just and as it was. The EFL was just inept. It is. That's what it is. And it, it felt like, OK, you've wound us up now and we've left three very good players in bed so they can be ready. And then for some reason, Huddersfield came and just opened up and said, have the ball and have space because how good can you be? And we showed them. I think having watched the highlights back this afternoon, um, some of the goals in there, Wendia's pass for Pukki's second goal, the Wendia and Dow link up where it's just like they're playing, you know, on the park, winding up local kids. Um, the look on the face of Keo after the fifth one's gone in when he's just looking around going, can someone help us? Can someone do something? Because we don't know how to stop them. It, it just, every time one went in, Max Aaron's appearing on the left wing to set a goal up. Why is our right back on the left wing almost playing as an inside forward in old-fashioned positions. And it was just, I cannot see us getting that much space at the weekend. But I'd love to. It'd be brilliant. Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? And, and the thing is with Huddersfield, I'm probably surprised, like you say, that A, they were so open, but B, that they kept they kept pressing badly and, and they kept doing it. They, I mean, they were persistent. You, you can give them that, but it was... Um, yeah, it was it was like cat and mouse at times, and and like you say, <laughs> Richard Keo, Richard Stearman, you can name numerous others who just looked um, gobsmacked. I think is, is probably the best word to use. They looked like they were probably going to need to talk to someone professional afterwards. That was that was the nature of, of the win, and uh, yeah, so devastating, so clinical. You, you mentioned a few names in there. We could probably pick all eleven to speak about, but Emmy Buendia, let's speak about him. Three assists, one goal. I guess we could lump Timu Puki into this as well. It's three goals and one assist for him. Those two are as good as anyone, if not the best in the championship right now, aren't they? How how brilliant have, have those two been this season, in, in your opinion? I, I basically like to dedicate 30 seconds of the show for, for Norwich fans to come on and speak about those two. So I'll, uh, I'll open the floor to you, Colin. Puki is never going to be Robert Flett for me but is quickly becoming my favourite striker that I've ever seen play for the club. And when you've got Roberts, Bellamy, Holt, all those names in there, Earnshaw, he, he's right out there. He's never going to be Robert Flex. I'm never going to be 10 years old watching him play. Buendia should not be in this division. How we have mugged people off to keep him has been an absolute joy. Two years ago when we got promoted, going up to Rotherham, we beat them 2-1. And going into the pub afterwards, play it. The fans of Rotherham just going, "What's he doing here?" And that was two years ago. He's now two years better. Uh, you know, I've seen the links today with Atletico and you know big clubs in Spain. He won't be in a Norwich shirt next year. We know this because somebody will be able to afford him. It's not going to be like Arsenal going his three p bad crisps, but we're Arsenal. Somebody will come in because he shouldn't be playing in what could be a mid-table or relegation scrap next year. He needs to be at the very top. And 
if the rumours of him, you know, going to play in the Copa America in the summer are true, even bigger clubs are going to spot him, and it's going to be painful to see him go. But he is. He's, he's going to be one of those players, like you say, when he does fly the nest eventually, whenever that day will come, that Norwich fans follow for the rest of, of his career and, and, and look look upon, like, I think, proud parents and go, actually, yeah. we played a real major part in his development. Like you say, it's I've, I've probably said it a few times this season, it's a real travesty, actually, that he's playing at this level, um, given his talent and given his ability. Um, Corey, let's, let's come to you. I want to speak a little bit about... Wayne Rooney, I remember um, you coming on here last time and I asked you a question. And I think it was along the lines of, do you think Wayne Rooney has, has come to Derby with a view to becoming the, the manager in the future? And I can't remember your exact response, so I'm not going to try and sort of paraphrase that. But that scenario has happened. He is in the dugout now. His last professional goal actually came in that game at Carroll Road and uh, I was there to witness it. Very fortunate to do so. What a what a free kick that was. A bit of a smash and grab on the day, but still the, the only side to beat Norwich at Carroll Road this season. Talk to us a little bit about him in the dugout and what he's, what he's offered Derby so far because initially it seemed to be sort of go fairly well, but it seems to maybe began to fade out maybe because of injuries more recently. Yeah, Connor, and I can't remember what I said last time either. Um, yeah. but, so I'm not going to keep in quote myself. Check that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think Wayne Rooney, obviously, last goal against Norwich and then Derby were really struggling in that autumn period. They made the decision to sack Philip Koku and I think it was pretty inevitable that he was going to go, nice guy, Great coach, wrong club, wrong time. Um, I think what he was trying to do was he was trying to set up a way with to play that you would do when you have elite players. Um, and, you know, when you're in this position, these guys make these four or five runs. And it was just getting overly complicated. And it always felt like Rooney was there. It felt like he was, um, I think, one of the guys who's, uh, I think Ollie from the Derby County blog put it as one in the cuckoo's nest. He always kind of felt like he was there. And it was always kind of like the heir apparent, and it didn't really, it didn't really come as a surprise. They they after they sacked Kaku, Darby tried to play this, did this weird coaching by committee where they had four men and they were all pointing in different directions, shouting the the same player four different things, and it spectacularly failed. And that experiment did not last very long, thank God. Um, and then they named Rooney permanent manager, and and like you say, Connor, it went really well. The first part, Darby kind of picked up some results, and this was basically off of the fact that. He simplified the game. He simplified the approach for it. You know, we're going to keep it very simple. We're going to, um, you know, just allow the players to play in a, not as complex. And he strengthened it defensively. He set him up. He set up a couple games very defensively. Um, and he's, you know, strengthened him defensively. And he was he was buoyed by the fact that Darby could get an occasional goal. And when you get an occasional goal and you don't concede, you're going to win games. Um, and that was basically what he was trying to do and how he was going about doing his business. That worked. Um, and to be fair, there was even talk. I'm sure Colin heard it in his household. There was even mention of the P word, the playoffs, um, for a period of time because Darby had moved up and they were like six points off the table. Um, so sorry, six points, not six points off the playoff places. And yeah, it just, there was just, it was snowballing of factors really. I mean, Darby got sucked in. Other results went certain ways. Darby really lost their way. Um, some injuries plagued them um, and, and are plaguing them now. They plagued them in the early part of the season as well. Injuries have started to, to, to do its rear ugly head. One of the things that was probably the major turning point was the loss of Christian Bielek, who um, at the time was probably the best midfielder in the championship. Um, obviously, I know you've got Emmy Buendi and I can see Colin shaking his head, but he was playing at that kind of level where he was, it was just, he was levels above. And like Colin said, like, like you guys have said with Emmy Buendia, it would be su surprising that he was at Derby next. It would be surprising if he's at Derby next season. He did his ACL, that kind of knocked the confidence out of Derby. And since that really good run of form where Derby had got to the playoffs, um, I think they had conceded, they, I think they had had conceded like three goals in, like nine, 10 games, something like that, only allowed like three or four shots for a period of time in a certain group of games as well. It just, the inconsistency played back the mentality, the the, the fragile mentality, the inconsistency played back into this team. Um, and Darby's really struggled since. It's just consistently, consistently inconsistent is the best thing I can say, Connor, about Darby. They had a lapless performance against Stoke, which was just dire, went into the international break, came out of it, 
wipe the floor with Luton for about 15, 20 minutes. Obviously, Luton were their own worst enemies. They had chances to get back in the game. They didn't finish it. Darby picked up a couple injuries in Lee Gregory and Martin Waghorn. And then you think, okay, we're going to build. We're going to get something. We're going to get something. And then they go into the game against Reading and get beat 3-1. Um, and so it, it's it's one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back. And while they're doing this, teams around them are picking up points and sucking them back into this relegation fight. But basically, Rooney's, like I said before, is, you know, he simplified things. He's tried to make it simple. But right now, I think the concerning thing from a Derby perspective, and it can go two ways. It can cut two ways. What I'm about to say is Rooney's basically said, yes, I'd like to have a style, but we need to put points on the board. So basically the next six games, whatever it takes to get the points on the board, which is fantastic because like I said earlier, you have to stay in this division um, and you need the points on the board to do that. But you would like to see some sort of coherent Derby County from week to week where you casually, yes, you're grinding out results. Yes, you're picking them up, but you're casually growing and you're seeing some sort of, some sort of growth or everything and something like that. But you're not really seeing it right now. And Rooney's gotten to the habit recently of setting teams up to face the opposition instead of just, we play this way. See if, you know, see how Norwich react to the way we play. No, he'll look at the Norwich team and he'll set it up completely different. Um, he's tried four at the back. He's tried five at the back. He's played, tried three, uh, three at the back with wing backs. You know, he's tried uh four, one, four, one. He's tried a four, two, three, when he's tried all these different formations and all these different puzzle pieces. And I think sometimes for the players, it's starting to get like, they don't know who's going to be in the team or what role they're going to have. And I think at this level with kind of the players that you're dealing with, because we're not dealing with this uh, Darby, I'm not going to speak for Timu Puki and Emi Buendia, but at Darby, they're not dealing with elite level players, right? At the, at the, the high end of the game. Sometimes they need that consistency to understand your job. It's just like you and Colin Connor in, in your daily job. If you don't know generally the battle rhythm of what you're going to do day to day, you're going to, you might struggle at doing, you know, oh, well, I need you to do this in 20 minutes. Well, that's not something really that I had done in a while. And then, oh, six weeks ago, you did this. So you're going to do this now. We're all going to struggle in our daily lives and our daily jobs when we don't have this general kind of consensus of what we're generally going to be doing. And I think that's one of the pitfalls of Rooney um, recently. He's also been out coached a couple of times, made some strange substitutions and stuff like that. But it's it's um, it's it's going to be a really interesting end to the season because he's had his honeymoon period. You've seen kind of what this team can do, grinding out results. It's not pretty, but you get you get wins and you get points, and that's how you stay in the division. Um, but it'll be an interesting next six games because Darby are on a knife edge here of of which way they're going to tip either in the championship or into league one. So it's going to be a very interesting end to the season. I, I'll just, uh, before I come back to you, Corey, I'll, I'll just go to Colin because uh, you, you pointed him out, him shaking his head there at your Christian Bielik assessment. So I'll, I'll, I'll let him come in. Um, go on, Colin, explain your thinking there. Oh, did Christian Bielik, when I, I take my, my own son to most Norwich games, occasionally we'll pop up the road to see Derby. He's a decent player. Um, one of the best, I, I think, is a bit of a stretch when, when you've got Colin Kazim Richards in that side, who has, who I have seen a few times this year on on the telly, has been phenomenal for that side. It just seems a a big a big jump as a statement. We'll leave it at that. I thought you were going to mention the words Ollie Skip, but uh... well, he's not ours, and we're going to be losing him as well. And we don't want to be on the edge of celebration and then start just getting all depressed at who could be going. Yeah, that's that's a fair point, Colin. We'll, we'll leave that there then. Um, Corey, just to, to come back to you, how do you how do you feel about this weekend? We've had opposition fans come on, I think, throughout the season and and explain this as a, or sort of describe this game really as a bit of a free hit for them. Derby are kind of in a position where they've got six games left. They're in a relegation battle. They need the points on the board. But equally, as we mapped out at the start of the show, they're playing a side that could potentially get promoted to the Premier League this weekend. So, how do you kind of view this one? Because you're running out of games, you're running out of points that that need to that, that you need to get to stay up. Like you said, they're important um, not not just for for Wayne Rooney's future, but also for Derby County's future and and to try and establish, like you say, that style, that foundations that maybe the club needs to get back to um, success. And and obviously, you you will hope that ends in in Premier League um, or promotion to the Premier League rather. But how do you see this game as Norwich City come to Pride Park? Because it's um, 
I think for most sides at the moment, it's, it's a pretty daunting task, but more so after a 7-0 win. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think when I look at this game, when you look at the remaining six games, right, if I want to look ahead to the remaining games that Derby have, they've got Norwich, and then you've got two, you've got, um, they've got Blackburn, Preston, who are both in and around where they are. Then they've got Birmingham, and then you've got um, uh, Swansea, and then you've got Sheffield Wednesday. So out of the remaining games, four of those games are with teams that are directly in and around you. And yes, Connor, I can sit here and I can say Norwich is a completely free hit because I don't think Darby's going to get anything out of the game. So that's the best, most optimistic way to look at it. But I don't think Darby can afford many more. Free, they, they can't afford a free hit. You have to, the Darby have to go there. They have to scrap. They have to try to get a point because if you've got Preston, you've got Blackburn or you've got Black, Black, Blackburn and Preston, if I could speak properly, you've got Blackburn and Preston coming up um, in the next week to 10 days. They're going to be fighting for their lives. They should, they, they've, their form has fallen off the table. You've got Birmingham who are scrapping. You've got Sheffield Wednesday who are scrapping, who have looked like they've picked up a little bit of form. Uh, Bowyer's maybe picked up a little bit of form at Birmingham, not much, but a little bit. Swansea have fallen off of form, but they're still going to be in and around the playoff chase. So they're not going to be doing it easy. And I know Norwich, uh, like you said last night, Connor with us was they want to get promoted. They want to win this league and potentially get a hundred points. So they can't afford to let off, and Darby can't afford a free hit. Darby have to go. They have to scrape. They have to fight. They have to do something. Um, I don't think they will, but I think you know you're playing a dangerous game if you're saying, "Well, this one can go because we're going to rely on these other, to try to beat these other teams." And I know Rooney um, a few games ago. I don't know whether it was like I think it was ten games remaining. He said he wanted to win four. I think he's won like one, maybe two. Um, so. Though you got to pick up the win somewhere. I don't see it coming against Norwich. And yeah, I would like to say that it's a free hit, but Darby can't afford a free hit, Connor, because other teams, other teams are going to be picking up points this weekend. That, and that's for sure. And Darby's going to get sucked back, sucked even further back down. And once you get sucked further back down, you're not going to be able to come back up at this point because there's not enough games to make it back. Um, so I would hope that Darby can go there and they can scrap and they can fight and they can do whatever they can to get to get something. I would be hopeful of a point. I'm hopeful that Norwich used up all of their goals for the month uh, against against Huddersfield um, because they scored more goals in that game against Huddersfield than Colin Kazim Richards has all season for Derby. <laughs> um, and and you know, I don't think Derby scored seven goals in a month to be honest with you, let alone in a game. So yeah, it's a free hit, Connor, but. No, it's not because you have to get points. So you can't afford a free hit at this stage. It's too it's too desperate for Derby, which is a strange strange thing to be in for this football club because they've not been in this situation for a long time. Um, and so it's strange to say. But yeah, Derby can't afford a free hit here. They've got to go and they've got to get something out this game. Yeah, and just to, to point out the uh, the situation at the bottom, we should be able to get the league table up here. So as you can see, Derby County in 18th heading into this weekend. Um, Rotherham, as you can see, uh, in 22nd on 35 points, but crucially have, what, four games in hand on Derby. So that's that's where the concern comes. As you can see, a lot of teams floating around, Birmingham, Coventry, Huddersfield, Derby on top of that, all floating around on 43 and, and 42 points. So it is a, a precarious situation for Wayne Rooney and his side. Um Colin, these games against teams at the bottom, particularly at this stage of the season, you probably label them as banana skins. They're, they're often quite difficult because you, you come up against a team scrapping for their lives, fighting for their future players, maybe fighting for their careers at a certain football club. League position isn't often the best factor to, to take into games, is it particularly in the championship where you can think you've cracked it and suddenly you get caught with, a, with a, a big blow on the chin? We nearly fumbled it two, two years ago with Wigan and Stoke uh, over an Easter period. I was at Wigan when there were thousands of us who took over that end and a dubious penalty was given. It relied on Pookie to get the point. Sheffield Wednesday spanked five past Swansea, I think it was, the other day. And they looked gone two weeks ago. This is a horrible division. It, it, it truly is a horrible decision. Division. Anyone can give you a bloody nose. Anyone can beat you. And if you don't turn up, and if you don't turn up ready for a proper game of football, you can be in a lot of trouble. And as I say, I, I've lived here 20 years. I've never seen us win at Cry Park. That is 
a ground I hate going to. I've seen us win at the City ground. You know, I've seen us get points down at Leicester. I've seen us get points over at Stoke. And, and to Burton, we won't count because that was two seasons of dire football. This is a ground that we don't play well at. This is a ground where I wouldn't be surprised if we got nil-nil at the weekend. You know, Rooney sent his side out against Barnsley the other week and basically went, we're going to play 11 at the back. We're going to hoof the ball up. You're going to hoof it back. We're going to hoof it up and then we'll see what happens. But if you can't, we're not going to let you score. We want a point here. And I don't know if we're going to have one of our can we break them down games. We've had a few this year. It's why that thumping was coming, but I just everything about me tells it's going to be a frustrating week. Such a high probably means we've got a low coming. Yeah, and I guess the, the luxury of Norwich's position means that you would probably say, even if they didn't, let's say they didn't even win a game theoretically between now and the end of the season, the points gap is is so great that it looks really unlikely that anyone's going to catch them anyway so in terms of the top two. But of course, it's that title race now that I think probably people are turning their attentions to. Do, do you fear, Colin, that after Tuesday night and how emphatic it was and how sensational it was, that there can be an element of after the Lord Mayor show about this weekend that Norwich maybe I don't know, com- complacency is maybe not the right word, but you can often see, I'll use the Manchester City game in the Premier League um, last season as a good example. They beat Manchester City, they went to Burnley and lost 2-0. And it, it's kind of the after the Lord Mayor show element, the hangover of a really big night, a really big win. Could you see that being a factor this weekend? Having been at Burnley that day when they cancelled all the trains out and having to get a taxi down to Manchester, it was a horrible, horrible day. Um, I can... <laughs> I don't think we've got the players that will be complacent. I do think we have an ability to overcomplicate sometimes. Play the ball, pass it to someone in a yellow shirt, keep passing it. We have very good players. We will get through. And then we have a... T- when Emmy has his moments and you start to see the arms go and his great pass doesn't come through, that's, that's my fear. I don't think it will be complacency. It will be something doesn't go right and then something else doesn't go right and we don't just go right let's step back come back at it we should be good enough to beat them we should be good enough to win the league with four or five games to spare turn over Bournemouth turn over Watford and we're not going to get caught and I think we've got the points there now because I think the number of games teams have got against each other I think if you really went into it statistically, I, I, we, we have enough and I don't think everyone can now get enough to catch us. Um, I don't have enough time and I'm not sad enough to sit and say, well, this is what, how much everyone could get. But it, it just feels like this weekend could be not a deflating weekend, but a weekend where we go, it's not that bad. When we got beat up at Preston two years ago, we then rolled over and went and turned over someone else in the northwest heavily Bolton, um, Bolton. yeah um so actually preston then turned someone over it's, it's kind of got a ring to it two years later um i can just see it being a frustrating day with what derby need with where they are a point is good enough for derby at the minute it's good enough for us and i can't see us taking any silly risks with it of we then have a week off, having been through everything we've been through with all the, you know, with Janulis playing at what was it, midnight on Wednesday and then landing Thursday afternoon and looking like a zombie, I think was the phrase. Having the week off to just go right, breathe, now we go and we win this probably feels like how it will be. And, and like, you, like you say, even if Norwich don't win uh, or, or do get a point, the reality is they, they may already be promoted by the time that... Uh, they play and kick off against Bournemouth in the, in the game next Saturday. Of course, uh, Brentford and Swansea both play in midweek. Norwich don't. So uh, we'll, we'll have a clearer picture. And of course, we'll have a clear picture as to whether it is um, entirely possible by kickoff on Saturday as well. Watford play Reading on the Friday evening. Not, um, not particularly a result that Norwich need to look out for in terms of securing their automatic promotion but no doubt they'll they'll be casting an eye with a view to the title uh, Swansea then play at midday away at Millwall which is a very tough place to go as Norwich found out earlier this year they're a team who, who tend to play on fine margins they don't concede a lot of goals they're still mathematically in for a shout of the, of the playoffs although you would probably say that looks unlikely at this stage so those two results will give Norwich a good picture of what uh, needs to happen 
by three o'clock on Saturday. Of course, Norwich need to beat Derby and hope that Brentford and Swansea both drop points. And if that scenario takes place, then they're back in the Premier League. Um, Colin, we'll come to you finally then, just to get your score prediction. Um, you, you've maybe hinted that you feel this is going to be a frustrating afternoon for Norwich at Pride Park. Um, just talk to us a little bit about how you see the game going and then finally your score prediction. It's going to be one of two, which is either going to be nil-nil or we're going to go three, four-nil win. I, it, I can't see it being yellow. I can't see us getting caught out the way we did at Carrow Road. Um, I, I can't handle the amount of pings my phone gets if we get mugged twice in a season by a team as, as not poor, that's unfair, inconsistent, I think, as Derby. Um, we had, you know... Two years ago, the whole thing was nobody did the double over us. And I can't see them doing it this time. But I can see it being frustrating. So I, I think 1-1 one, one is where my head is going to sit at. Lovely stuff, Colin. Thank you very much. Corey, let's come to you from a Derby perspective. Uh, you're, you're the home side. Like you say, no game is a free hit at the minute. They're all important. You guys need the points. How do you see this game going? And, and let's have your score prediction as well. Yeah, I think um, Colin makes some really interesting points there, and I could definitely see where it could be a draw because, like Colin said, against Barnsley, it was, well, you're not going to beat us, and if you want to set up like that, then that's fine, but you're not going to score. And then, you know, you, you walk out with a point. Um, we have seen at times that Derby do scrap. They have something in them occasionally that they come out and they can they can scrap and they can really fight for a, for a, for a point or for a win. I don't see a win coming in this game. I just don't. I think Norwich, um, I think there will be some sort of slight hangover from the Huddersfield game, um, but I don't think the hangover will be enough to stop them from from getting all three points. I'd like to say a draw because I think Derby desperately need the points, and it's not you know it's not necessarily going to hurt Norwich. It's just going to delay your title, your, your guard of honor by a week, or sorry, your, your, promotion, your promotion social media stuff by a week. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to say 2-0 Norwich. I think Norwich have just got a little bit too much uh, in there as well. Derby's got so many injuries. They're crippled by injuries. Um, Martin Waghorn and Lee Gregory are out. Nathan Byrne, one of Derby's best players, is out with concussion. They've got Matt Clark and George Edmondson out. Not that Edmondson features a lot, but it, it goes to the the strength and the, the lack of depth uh, defensively. Rooney's already said in his pre-match press conference this afternoon that the bench is going to be very, very young. So if Derby, if, if Norwich do get a goal up, there's going to be very little on Derby's bench that can try to change a game for him. Um, you know, and I try to be, I try to just be fair and honest in my assessment, Connor. I think, I think it's going to be too much for them. I'd like to see him get a point, but I think it'll be a two nil Norwich victory because I think Pookie's going to, Pookie and Buendia are going to have a, have a, have a nice day. Unless Graham Shinney kicks Buendia five minutes in, which would be great. But um, you know, that's what Graham Shinney does. But yeah, I can see a two nil, two nil Norwich victory. You know, I'm really looking forward between, to that battle between Graham Shinney and Emmy Buendia. I think if if them two square up to each other, that's going to be a hell of a contest, I think. Um, and one name you didn't mention, who I thought was sensational in, in the Carroll Road game, Curtis Davis missing for this game as well, a long-term injury. He was very, very good um, in the reverse fixture and, and a key part of why Derby kept a clean sheet against Norwich. Although, um, I don't think Norwich had Emmy Buendia and, and Todd Campwell that day. So, um, maybe that was a factor. Who knows? Of course, there we go. Thank you very much for for, to Corey and to, to Colin and leave all their links down below so you can check them out and follow them and and uh, particularly Corey with, with, with his podcast very good stuff and uh, you, you invited me on so uh, that's that's always very much appreciated Colin as well thank you very much for, for coming on uh, hopefully at some point uh, in the next week or so Norwich will secure their promotion if they do we will be hosting a, a bumper terrorist talk we're going to call it we're going to get loads of Norwich City fans on we're going to celebrate what has been a remarkable season if you'd like to get involved drop us a message drop me a message and uh, we'll get you on that uh, that promises to be good but let's get there first Norwich City need to beat Derby on Saturday and hope results go in their favour if not then we're probably looking at a promotion without Norwich even kicking a ball we'll have a good idea at Saturday three o'clock uh, we'll be across it as well on uh, on the pink and website so uh, make sure to to check all the usual channels thank you very much for watching Make sure you stay safe and we'll see you again very, very soon. <laughs>